Hi everyone, welcome to the third installment of the Historical Romance Virtual Reading Series. I am Katherine Grant, uh, the host of this reading series, and I'm really excited to um, be joining you again this Wednesday night to gather some historical romance together. Uh, so for those of you who haven't attended before or don't know or want a reminder, uh, we're doing this historical romance virtual reading series because all of us authors are participating in October at a uh, live conference, Romancing the Gold Coast, which is a fun historical romance weekend in Long Island, New York, where everyone who's a fan of historical romance is invited to come, step back in time, meet some of your favorite authors, explore some of the uh, tropes and activities of the genre that we all love, and participate in a costume ball. So I'm going to tell you more about the conference later in the evening, but I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that's why we're doing this series um, and why we're welcoming uh, the authors who we're welcoming. Um, tonight we have a full lineup. We've got uh, five authors who are going to read a, a range of Regency and Scottish and even some time travel in there. Um, we are going to do Q&A throughout. So when you have a question for an author, feel free to type in your question in the chat. I'll see it and I'll make sure that the author gets to answer it. Um, and we also have a lot of fun prizes lined up to raffle away, including signed copies of several different books. So stick around for the whole evening to get to all of the different raffle prizes. As long as you have registered for the event, which if you're here, you registered, you are on my list and I'm doing a random number generator to fairly poll who the winner is. So um, stick around for the raffle prizes and the readings and the historical romance love. So tonight I am really to kick things off with again, Alyssa Alexander. So welcome to the stream, Alyssa. Hi, thank you so much <laughs> for having me. Um, I'm looking forward to this. So I am doing a reading from A Dance with Seduction, which is also the book that I'm planning on giving away. Um, this is the story of, it's the third book in my Spy in the Tom series. And it's the story of Maximilian Westwood, who is a code breaker, and um, Vivian the Fleur, who is a spy, and her code name is The Flower. So you'll have her, you'll hear her referred to that way um, in the book. So um, I'm going to start out here. It's chapter one. So, all right, chapter one. Uh, <clears throat> Get out of my study. He hunched over the bit of Russian text he was translating, though her scent told him she was near. She always smelled clean, strange, given her various professions. Gunpowder or perfume would be more appropriate. Of course, she didn't leave, which meant his work would be disturbed for the remainder of the evening. The warm fire and soothing glass of brandy he was about to enjoy would also be deserved, disturbed. He was looking forward to that brandy. Maximilian Westwood did not look up from the Russian missive. Perhaps if he did not meet her gaze, she would go away. The flower could exit his study by whatever mysterious method she'd entered and leave him in peace. Light footfalls approached him from behind, followed by the quiet, decidedly feminine sound of a throat being cleared. She was still there. Confound her. I am not in that line of work any longer, mademoiselle. The nib of his quill was becoming dull. He eyed the feather carefully. Yes, most definitely dull. Opening the top drawer of his desk, he reached for a short knife. I suggest you find somebody else. Breaking the flower's ridiculous spy codes was less important than his other tasks, such as whittling the point of his quill. I have a need for you, monsieur. He scowled at the quill and shifted in his chair. Her voice was sultry and sensual, as befit her profession. Well, one of them, at any rate. But her words sounded as if she were advancing a sexual liaison. I'm no longer in His Majesty's employ. I've retired from code breaking. Thankfully, he only wanted to study words on the page. And as he excelled at translations, his services were in high demand. Blowing on the nib to dislodge any loose shavings, he still did not turn to look at her, though he could sense her prowling around his study. Baffling that she could enter the house without even his sharp-eared assistant discovering her. This matter is not related to his majesty, monsieur. 
Something stirred against his shoulder. A light touch, little more than her clothing brushing his. Her scent came again. Soap. Not overly sweet as some ladies used, but plain soap. Maximilian ignored it. He wanted to work, and letters and words were easier to understand than gorgeous spies masquerading as French opera dancers and mistresses. He bent over the paper and pretended the flower was not standing beside him. This matter is only for myself. Her voice layered over the scratching of the quill. It is coded. A small gloved hand slid into his vision, blocking his view of the Russian text. Between her fingers was a scrap of paper. He brushed her hand away, even in his, as his mind recorded the note. Two inches on the vertical height, approximately four on the horizontal length. Eight square inches with two lines of text across. The paper reappeared in front of him, still held tightly in, his finger, in her fingers. He supposed persistence was a necessary quality for a spy. I shall pay you, monsieur. Hell and the devil. Being a second son, his inheritance was not large, and the government did not pay translators particularly well, or code breakers for that matter. Maximilian's pockets, while not light, were not exactly heavy. With a sigh, he finally looked up into the flower's face. Her beauty simply stole his breath. No doubt, as it did every other man. An oval face was framed by a riot of inky curls and a defined widow's peak, with eyes the same deep shade as her hair and narrowed in watchfulness. As she usually did when she worked, the flower wore all black. A small ebony coat, breeches, and boots. A cap was clutched in her other hand. The flower might be dressed as a man, but there was no mistaking the flare of hips or the exquisite face, or the determined light in her eyes. Just this note? Oui. Her full pink lips curved up in a satisfied grin. Your fee is two pounds? He leaned back in his chair and eyed that grin. He didn't like it. Or her. Too sneaky by half, and so gorgeous a man might forget all boundaries of respectability. Five pounds. Five? One black brow rose to a wicked point. My brain, it has been lost, do you think? Two pounds. 10 shillings, four and 10. He would have accepted the two pounds from anyone else. The loss of this brandy and his solitude was worth more than two pounds. Three pounds, three and 10, acceptable. He set her paper beside the two sheets already on his desk where it lay like a bright beacon on the polished surface. Return tomorrow night and I shall have it for you. No. Leaning over, she tapped a finger on her note with gloves that matched the rest of her ensemble. She would be near to invisible in the dark with all that black clothing, which was her intention, no doubt. I have need of it now, s'il vous plaît. I cannot break the code now. I am translating Russian for a client who already paid me. Setting his fingers on the original Russian letter, he skimmed them over the lines of text until he found the place he had left off. You have not yet paid me. Mon Dieu. She muttered it, but a coin landed on the Russian letter. Another, then more, until three pounds ten lay scattered over the document. His temper spiked. There was an order to his projects. The Russian project first. Tomorrow he would translate a Greek paper on the study of waterfowl. Then Vivian Lafleur's spy code. I cannot do it immediately. He shoved the coins off the Russian letter. Your note is too complicated. The symbols, the order, it will take time. In his peripheral vision, he saw her shoulders sag in defeat. A small movement, but she always stood so straight and tall, shoulders back and head high, a dancer's pose. Even the slightest movements of those shoulders showed. Quite deeply at the moment, he wished the gentleman in him would stay quiet. Very well, I will have it by morning. Sleep would be unlikely, though staying awake all night to translate an interesting bit of text was not a new occurrence. Thank you. Merci. Her voice sounded odd. Hoarse, perhaps, as if she were going to cry. Mademoiselle Lafleur? He turned his head, angling it to look up at her. If you are going to be a watering pot, get out of my study. Pointed chin jerking up, she cleared her throat. I am not a watering pot. My throat is sore. I've recently recovered from an illness. 
Spinning on her heel, she stalked across the room, dark curls swirling through the air like a, well, he didn't know. No one had hair like the flower. For once, her boots made more noise than a whisper. Now it was his turn to grin. And that is the end of the first scene in A Dance with Seduction. I love it. I can so relate to him <laughs> being like, I have an order. Don't, don't <laughs> interrupt my order. <laughs> <laughs> right exactly yeah exactly. and gloria on the stream says she loves that he's a translator because she is also a translator oh excellent wonderful i love that yeah I love it. so um how long did it take you to write this book uh oh actually there's kind of a story about behind that one um so i started this book during NaNoWriMo which is for those of you who don't know national writing uh national novel writing month it's november and the goal is to write 50,000 words and um i had i had this book in my head i had the characters in my head and it just kind of spilled out of me um, so my goal had been to write 50,000 words for that month, but I promised myself if I got to 25,000 words, I would give myself a nice long bath with a shower and candles and a book and relaxation. And if I got to the 50,000 words, which I didn't quite, um, I would, uh, treat myself to a pair of leather boots that I had been like knee high leather boots that I had been eyeing for like months. Um, so I didn't quite make it to the 50,000 words. I got to about 35,000 and about a week before the end of November, um, my husband said, are you going to buy yourself those boots? Cause you work so hard. And I was like, no, I didn't meet my goal. There's no way I'm going to. And, um, and then I sold my first book. Well, two books actually to Berkeley. And so I got that call the last week of November. And when I came home from work that day, um, I had my bought my husband had bought a really expensive bottle of wine and the boots. Oh. So they were there when I got home as a congratulations gift. So it still took me probably another two months to finish the book after that. But um, that's one of those moments I'll never forget is I worked so hard, but I wasn't going to treat myself. And then I sold those two books and my darling husband um, treated me. So That's amazing. Um, so that was real fun. Life hero. Yes, exactly. Real <laughs> life hero. Totally. Totally a real life hero. He still is. Yeah. So yeah, um, that was lots of fun. Kristen's asking, how did you become interested in writing historical spy romances? Ah, okay. So historical has always been my jam. So, I mean, I got started on, well, Julia Quinn, Judith McNaught, um, Jude Devereaux. Uh, so those are like, you know, the great, the originals, um, Catherine Woodweiss. And so I've always loved historical romance just in and of itself. And then as far as the spy aspect goes, um, I really like suspense mixed with my romance always have so i read a lot of like um well like police procedurals so like think jd rob nor roberts you know where you're adding in that suspense element and so when it got time or when i started decided to to start writing um i knew i wanted historical and i knew i wanted a time period where there were going to be spies and war and things like that going on. So um, so I chose the Napoleonic era, the Napoleonic Wars, just because it was an era I knew and a um, uh, historical area I knew, but then also just the research fascinated me. Um, and I like to make my heroines, um, my first heroine was a smuggler. My second one was, uh, she had actually, like fought at the Battle of Waterloo and my third one here was a spy. And so I tend to kind of follow those heroines that are um, really strong and uh, and really take part in what's going on in the, in the history. Can you tell us a little bit about like what you're working on right now? Ooh, yeah. So I'm starting a new series. Um, so I haven't said a lot about it like online, but it's another spy series starting a little bit earlier. And um, the first heroine, again, is a spy, and I love her. I just love her. Um, and she is a very individualistic person, so she doesn't wear skirts. She is, and she 
has nothing, she wants nothing to do with uh, family or love or romance or relationships or anything. She's completely focused on uh, gaining her own spy team. And so when she meets the hero, who is number one, she, he's a duke and she is um, uh, a commoner, right? She's a spy. And so she was recruited. And, uh, and so there's a lot of clashing going on between what he needs as a duke and what she needs or wants as a spy, like trying to get her own team. Um, and then, uh, and then the, the suspense that they're trying to, to solve. So yeah, I love my new heroine. I just, I just love her. So I'm about as of today, cause I was writing this afternoon, I'm at like 69,000 words, which is about, Ooh. yeah, almost done. Maybe 20, I have maybe five scenes left to write. So almost That's finished. Awesome. Yep. That's awesome. Of course, now you might be at that point where you're like, oh, I don't want to say goodbye to the characters. Let me oh, slow no, down. I don't. <laughs> I don't. But, they're, but it's going to be a series. I have like three other books planned, so we'll be seeing them again. So so I'll oh. get to have them back. <laughs> That's good. So um, speaking of people that we don't want to say goodbye to, we're going to see each other for the first time, and you'll see other friends that you know at Romancing the Gold Coast. Yes. So what are you looking forward to about the conference? Um, actually, just seeing people in real life. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also reconnecting because there's a number of authors that I know either personally, but also from just online that I've not actually ever met at conference. So, and then there's a couple of old friends that I'm really looking forward to seeing. Um, my roommate actually moved to, she was in Michigan and she moved to um, California, Gina Conkle. She'll be on oh. I think, next week. And, uh, and I haven't seen her in like a year and a half. And so I, we talk all the time, but I miss her a lot. So it's going to be really nice to get to see her in person and, and to get back to seeing people in person. So that'll be really fun. Plus I'm going to have a costume. And that'll be great. <laughs> I know the costumes are so fun. <laughs> yeah. so. Awesome. Well, I know uh, you have a signed copy to give away of the yeah, dance. Yes. So everyone at your desks, please make a drum roll. Do -do -do -do. <laughs> <I> do that. <laughs> All right, we have the winner is Amy McGrath. Okay. So I will connect you guys um, after the event. I just wrote the name down. We have it. Yes. Amy, exactly. congratulations. <laughs> By the way, I usually Amy. stick a couple of extra things in, like some swag and stuff. So you might get some extra presents besides the besides the book. So how exciting. Well, thank you so much, Alyssa. It's been great to uh, have you on tonight and to get to know you. And I can't wait to see you in October. And I hope some of the people on tonight can also see you in October. I feel the same. All right. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> All right, so now um, I would like to introduce the next author as I press the right buttons. We have Angeline Fortin, who is writing a Highlander time travel romance. So everyone who loves yeah. her, get excited. <laughs> um, and Hi. I'm also excited. I haven't asked yet, Angeline, but I read that you've worked as a historical interpreter at Colonial Williamsburg. So I'm definitely going to ask you a bunch of questions about that when we meet in person. <laughs> uh, kind of kind of conveniently, the uh, main character of my latest book also was a historical interpreter at Colonial Williamsburg. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You always draw on what you know, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm happy to be here. I do feel a little bit like a second grader who got called on to read aloud in class, so I'm a little nervous. So bear with me um, while I do this. Um, it's funny because, you know, they, they say those who cannot do teach. So this is more like those who cannot do speeches right. So I'm going to give it a shot and we'll see how it goes. Um, I have chosen a passage from my most recent release, uh, that one right there, uh, a Scott Worth Having, that just came out last week. Um, I did choose a chapter uh, that has no dialogue, and I did that on purpose because um, I think it would be unforgivable for me to butcher a Scottish dialogue when their accent is so beautiful. So um, it will just be a, a narrative uh, chapter. So 
I hope we're all good with that. So I'll get started. This is chapter one of a Scott worth having. Cloud and Battlefield, present day. For the third time in as many minutes, Jenny Hughes's phone rang. And for the third time in as many minutes, she sent it to voicemail. Voicemail she would delete without listening to it. She had all the rest. A deluge of recordings containing any or all of the following. Name calling, accusations, ultimatums, and a few rhetorical questions to ice the cake. What the fuck, Jenny? Why did you skip town? He should know the answer to that to get away from him, to find some measure of peace away from a man who had been promoted from mere asshole to stalker over the past five months. Dealing with her ex-husband had become an uphill, losing battle. So what had she done? Traded one battlefield for another. She grimaced at the irony and stared out over Clad and Battlefield. Her most recent stop on her journey toward avoidance, both origin and destination, and the barren wasteland her life had become. In truth, beyond the vast visitor center, Culloden was a little more than that. A field, a broad, flat expanse of waving grass in the wind. For all her close Scottish heritage and the numerous trips her family had taken to Scotland to visit Granny throughout her childhood, they'd never visit the, visited the historical site. Perhaps her parents thought three young girls would grow restless without something more engaging or, or exciting to view. Two out of three might have, Jane and Bronte, were not great lovers of history. Ginny would have been the exception. Unfortunately, though she was the baby of the family, her wishes were rarely catered to. Now she couldn't believe she'd waited so long to visit. The desolate landscape, almost absence of, absent of tourists on a rainy spring morning, roused emotion so powerful she was reluctant to tread on its grounds. Instead, she opted for the path to the right that circled the field instead of for, foraging straight Forage, foraging straight in. The grinding crunch of her footsteps as she followed the gravel trail were the only sounds to break the, to break the silence other than the whisper of the wind through the grass and trees. Further afield, rows of wide-spaced blue and red flags marked the formations of the Scottish and British troops respectively. It was difficult to imagine this nothingness as a battlefield with armies assembled one across from the other Uniformed figures in red and white to one side, a motley, mismatched bunch of proud and, yes, arrogant Scotsmen to the other. Had they truly thought to win? According to the ex exhibits inside the visitor center, it had taken only an hour for the Jacobites to lose. An hour for the blood of, a thousand, of thousands of Highlanders to seep into the ground. As slow measured steps carried her down the path, a solemn chill seeped into her and sadness settled into her chest. It was almost as if the tragedy of the past called through time, a silent cry heard not with the ears, but with the heart. Pain, loss, sorrow. A few steps down the path, a thatched cottage stood alone in the shade of a quartet of squat rounded trees. According to the marker in the yard, Leenac Cottage, built in the early 18th century, was the only remaining example of the common structure of the time. Given its position in relation to the battlefield, it was thought the cottage might have been used as a field hospital. Despite, despite the ac academic appeal to learn more, the call of the field beyond cast an undeniable lure. Ginny circled the cottage. A gust of wind whirled around her, whipping her long hair across her face. She pulled the strand from her mouth and secured the tousled mass with an elastic she kept around her wrist as she continued to the south where the flat moors began to undulate in the rise and fall of random mounds covered in tall grass, some small, some larger. The trail bent to skirt them, and her steps lagged with something akin to dread, dread weighing heavily in her chest. This was hollowed ground beneath her feet. The profundity of it all had, ex of all it had experienced, all the blood that had soaked into it, the pain, sorrow, and loss. They pressed against her and melded like an emotion that weighed on her already. Farther down the pathway, a couple stood close together. They were a wonderfully attractive pair, she noted, thankful for the distraction to whisk away an ounce of her sadness. The woman, a willowy redhead, clung to the man's arm as he pointed to one of the many stones that dotted the shorter grass along the pathway. As tall as she was, the man towered over her. Bra, burly, and bonny with black hair tousled by the wind. Had he worn a kilt, 
He would have embodied any woman's wildest fantasy of the quintessential Scotsman. Even Jenny, for all of her shattered ideals, couldn't help but sigh. Yet something about the set of his broad shoulders as he bent his head to speak to the woman bespoke grief, even heartache. Jenny paused on the pathway, unwilling to intrude on the particularly mournful moment. A moment later, the man lifted his head, running a hand through his hair and down over his face as if surreptitiously wiping away a tear. With a short nod, he nodded to the woman who set a posy of wildflowers at the base of the upright stone. They moved along the path and Ginny waited until the couple had put some distance between them before she resumed her course and paused where they had moments before. His sorrow lingered there, engulfed her and became her own. The rounded rough hewn stone with wildflowers nestled at its base was about a half meter tall and wide and covered and carved with the inscription Clan Urquhart. Similar stones were gathered across the vicinity. Wooden, she looked from one to the other. Clan McIntosh, Clan MacDonald, Clan McLean, Clan Fraser, and then mixed clans. Across the footpath, a tall cairn had been erected. The marker set into the front of it explained their significance. The graves of the gallant Highlanders who fought for Scotland and, Pr and Prince Charlie are marked by the names of their clans. The mounds in the field weren't natural. The dead, and identified only by the tartan they wore, had been buried in mass graves, anonymously along with their clansmen. Numb, she continued down the path, pausing to acknowledge each stone and the loss it represented. Toward the center of the battlefield, the bench was inlaid with a gold plate. We followed you, O Prince, to this ocean of flatness and bullets. She pressed a palm against the engraved words as she stared out over the desolate breath of the Dramosi Moor. She may not have been able to picture the battle, but she swore she could hear the cries of war and agony, the clash of swords and roar of guns and cannons. And most assuredly, she sensed the echo of what had been left behind, pain, loss, sorrow, and anger. Looking across the field, she saw, or rather imagined she saw, a ghostly figure in a forlorn, kilted, the figure of a forlorn, kilted Highlander. His lips moved. Defeated, the word came to her on the wind, filled with anguish, haunting anguish. That was what had clung to her since she first stepped foot on the path. It clung heavily over the battlefield, tangible as a morning fog. It had always been the same for Jenny since she was young. Historical sights roused an empath empathic pang in her heart, as if she shared the emotions of the people long dead. Patriotic righteousness and triumph during the days she had worked at Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia, defeat and misery at battle at Gettysburg Battlefield, the torment and frustration and fury in Selma where the civil rights movement of the 1960s had been met with brutality and bloodshed and death. It had taken years for Jenny to realize not everyone experienced the same vicarious sympathy to history. They didn't experience the same ache in their hearts as, as she for those who had suffered loss or pulse racing excitement for those who had found victory. She often felt the truth of history calling out to her if only because she listened. So she taught it, studied it and cherished it for the lessons despite the heartache, content to never let the past die. Now, when she wished more than anything for the past, hers in particular to fade away, she'd been unable to shake away memories that haunted her. Claudin had seen blood and tears, victory on one side, defeat on the other. They were nothing more than a whisper of the past, gone but for the remembrance of a few how she wished she could put the past behind her and simply let it all go. And she will in chapter two. <laughs> so. Thank you so much. That was really captivating. Nervous. So I do oh. tend to kind of skip words and stuff. So that is maybe not an exact word, to word for word. Um, well, everyone should go buy your book and read it and they can compare it to this YouTube if they really want to find yeah. out. They totally could. Live edits. <laughs> <So, yeah. laughs> we have a couple of questions for you. Um, Chris wants to know, where do you find the ideas for your stories? Do you start with the present or the past when um, you have time travel? For this one in particular, um, this series, almost all of it has been based off of um, a trip that my husband and I took to Scotland a couple of years ago. Yeah, my research trip. So um, we went for two weeks and we drove... Um, basically all over the kind of upper left-hand 
quadrant of Scotland and visited um, all of the places that I've written about in these three books. So uh, just seeing them and kind of feeling that same kind of thing that I read about, you know, um, it really sticks with you. And I really wanted to put those places into, into my stories. So, yeah, I think probably everyone who loves historical fiction can really relate to that sense of you step into a place and you can, you know, put yourself into the experience and kind of feel this empathy. I, I think so. I think that's why people who read historical romance more than anything read it is because they do love the history and they love the, you know, not just the dates and times, but what people felt, you know, in the past and what they lived through and, and all that stuff. So I try to take my characters and put them, you know, not just into a, a time, but into, into, you know, a life that has, you know, real trauma, you know, a lot of times. So um, I tend to write a little heavy sometimes, like it's deep, it's you know, <laughs> moody and emotional, but, um, but you know, I feel like that's how people would be, you know, if they actually did that. So, yeah. yeah. And so you said this is based on a trip you took to Scotland. Is there anything mm -hmm. like, are there particular eras of history that call to you or is it more about where geographically you want to go? Um, I, I mean, I write in my his, in my historical series that I have, I write straight up uh, Victorian and a little bit of Regency, but in the many, um, I'm not even going to try to count it, time travel ones that I've written, um, I tend to just kind of find an event that interests me, a historical time itself. Like uh, I've been everywhere from, I've actually several books kind of centered around the mid um, 18th century around Culloden, but I've gone as far back as, you know, like the early 1500s and up to the, you know, 1910s in that era. So yeah. it's just, it, it's just about what, what happened and, you know, I, I want to embrace that sometimes. So yeah, you know, yeah. Right. So, hey, they're going there now. What can we make them do while they're there? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So. And uh, I know you mentioned that you have a costume for romancing the Gold Coast. Um, are you looking forward to the costume ball? Um. Yes, actually, we're huge lovers of Halloween and cosplay in this house. So, <laughs> um, it's just kind of like another little. I'm going to call it my um, my Titanic cosplay because it's so Edwardian uh, dress. So I'm going to just kind of picture myself strolling on the the deck of the Titanic in my my uh you know yeah. 1910s kind of dress so yeah I, it'll be it'll be fun so. yeah. <laughs> yeah and do you have any tips for readers who are considering going to the conference like what they can think about or, or plan around to make it the most fun conference they've been to i've heard there's a lot of vineyards <laughs> lot there of are yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um i mean that's kind of my plan i i, I uh I mean, I've been to New York City, I think a lot, you know, maybe not a lot of people, but um, have been to the city itself. So I'm going to be centering my kind of explorations. I've never really been to Long Island. And I've heard that there's, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of great scenery up and down the coast. So I'm kind of thinking a nice little drive around um, the whole island would be tons of fun and a little stop for a tasting here, a little stop for a tasting there, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah I think a lot of people aren't familiar, like they've heard of Long Island, but they aren't familiar with it. And Long Island is um, a long island, but it, it has uh, a lot of great uh, features, including, like you said, there are vineyards that grow their own wine, yep. or grow their own grapes and produce wine. Um, there are oyster farms, the Hamptons, which is like the quintessential, like, Really, houses. <laughs> yeah, it's a thing to do. Yeah, there are all the way at the end. There are lots of beaches on the North Shore. They're stony. Mm -hmm. On the South Shore, they're sandy. Mm -hmm. So, plus um, it'll be you know it's going to be fall. You know, I think you know uh, Kim uh, has said you know that the leaves should be tur turning by then. So, I mean, the scenery should be yeah. really, really beautiful. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm kind of looking forward. I was thinking I might drive. I mean, it's like only. It's only 18 hours in the car, so, you know, <laughs> so just so I don't have to worry about you know trying to find a way to 
get around to everything I want to see. I was, I was kind of toying with that, but we'll see from Minnesota to Long Island is that's a ways. So it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did forget to mention, um, up beforehand, I am giving away a copy of this book, a paperback copy of this book Great. for the raffles. So, well, now that you mention it, let's do that drum roll. Yeah, drum roll. And, um, <laughs> number, okay, 22. Chelsea Waters. Congratulations, Chelsea. Okay, I'm just making a note and I will connect you guys after the event. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Angeline. I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, I, thank you I for really bearing with me. <laughs> thank you for bearing with me. I appreciate it. You did it. a great job. <laughs> great. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, bye. Bye. All right. So coming up, we also have Lori Ann Bailey, who also writes Scottish historical romance. I'm going to do a reading. Um, and we have Monica Burns coming along to do a reading. Before I get to that, though, I wanted to take some time to tell you more about Romancing the Gold Coast because we've been mentioning it a couple of times and I want to make sure everyone has a chance to learn about it. So let me figure out how to share my screen, pressing the right buttons. And we do have, um, you know, our conference organizer, I believe, is on live watching YouTube with us. So feel free to pop your questions about the conference in to the chat and I'll try to answer and Kim might be able to answer them. So like I said, uh, Romancing the Gold Coast is a weekend conference for historical romance lovers to step back in time and really feel like you are experiencing the historical romance genre. It is October 21st to 24th this fall, 2021 in Glen Cove, New York. And like uh, I was just talking with Angelina about, um, Long Island, Glen Clove is part of Long Island, which is right outside of New York City. And it is the part of Long Island where generally the Great Gatsby took place. So think about that as your inspiration for what this will look like. This is the mansion where the conference is taking place. So this is um, where you'll be staying in the hotel and also the um, actual, you know, the venue where everything fun will be happening. Um, and you can see that it really will make you feel like you're part of that glitzy historical romance world. Uh, one of the top reasons to come is to meet your favorite authors. As we've been showing with this virtual reading series, we have over 30 historical romance authors coming. And part of the point is just for us all to meet you and to connect with you uh, readers and talk about why we all love historical romance. Now this is the inaugural Romancing the Gold Coast. So these pictures are from other conferences because Kim is organizing this conference for the first time. But these are pictures of Kim meeting authors who will be there, like Kerrigan Byrne and Terry Brisbane and Gina Conkle. And uh, you know, that's the sensation that we're going for for this conference. So we're hoping it will be really easy for you to hop in, meet us, feel like all of a sudden we're best friends and we can tell you more about where we get our inspiration from. We will also, since we are all geeks and lovers of the historical romance genre, we will be doing a lot of activities to really feel like we are part of the historical romance world. So there are going to be a couple of marquee events, including a tea party that will be catered by the executive chef. Uh, there will be a live harpist accompanying things, which I keep mentioning because I love the harp, so I'm very excited about that. <laughs> and then at the costume ball, you're encouraged to wear a costume. You're not required to wear a costume, but you're encouraged to wear a costume. Um, and every author will be partnering with another author to decorate a table. So that will be um, bringing a little extra flavor to it. And we will, um, you know, be dancing and partying together. And that's also catered by the executive chef, who's an award-winning chef. Um, other activities include author speed dating so that you get a chance to meet all the authors, book signings, historical crafts, masquerade, mask making, Georgian bingo, and Regency card sharps. So all of these are designed to make it feel like, you know, these things that we've read about in books that we're always like, oh, that sounds fun. Now you can do them and you can do them with the authors who are creating the worlds that you love so much. So um, that is the gist of the conference.
And uh, the registration deadline is July 15th. Uh, so that Kim can get all the numbers solidified with the venue. So that is in less than a month. So if you're considering it, um, just be sure to make your decision before then. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them right now. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen real quick. Just make sure. Um, so Lorianne is coming on in about 20 minutes. So before we hop on to that reading. I actually have a little surprise <laughs> that I organized for you all, um, which is some historical romance trivia. So I invite you to head on over to this link, crowd live slash BWT2D. Um, I will drop that in the comments so that you can click through. And, and I'm going to um, host this trivia. It's gonna be a quick five question historical romance trivia. Um, and click through that and I will get it started. It's going to be off of YouTube, but I'm still here on YouTube, so you can keep me open in a tab so you can hear me. Uh, but I will be launching the trivia. Again, I see if there any wiggle room on the registration day. I'm not sure specifically what kind of wiggle room there is. Um, so if Kim's on, she can hopefully answer that for you. But I imagine if you reach out to her, she can work with you on that. Okay, so head on over to crowd.live slash BWTD, and I am going to figure out how to start the game. <laughs> do, 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 do. Where's the play button? Hmm. Play, show. Start the countdown timer. Start countdown. We'll see if this works. I thought this would be a little fun uh, uh, <laughs> intermission show. Oh, the first question should be on your screen. And Regency Romance is set in the early 1800s. Because an English king ceded power to his son due to mental illness, which made his son Prince Regent. Which king went mad? We've got George II, George III, George IV, or George V. And the answer, if it will let me show live results. The correct answer is George III. So... I'm trying to see if I can show you the correct answer. There we go. That is the correct answer. So congratulations to those of you who knew that. My little uh, call out there is that Hamilton features George III. He's the one who sings, I'll be back, or you will be back. Okay, next question is, it's not showing, there we go. Which of these is not a Bridgerton sibling? I think this is pretty uh, easy in terms of questions, but uh, Eloise, George, or Hyacinth is not a Bridgerton sibling. You've seen the show. I do believe they've said all of the names. If you've read the books, you definitely have heard all the names. Okay, answer is is George, the uh, other brother, actually Gregory. So congratulations to those of you who got that right. Okay, the next question is, doo -doo -doo -doo. Fabio is iconic as the romance covers in the 1980s and 1990s. He is also known for a 1996 ad campaign for which brand? I can't believe it's not butter, 
Volkswagen, Gateway Computers, the I only learned this recently, but I've heard that it's actually like common knowledge. So it looks like everyone's getting this right. Congratulations. It's, I can't believe it's not butter. Who knew? I watched these on YouTube because they're available on YouTube and there are very strong George of the Jungle vibes. Uh, I don't mind. I loved George of the Jungle. Okay, second to last question. What is the name of the Scottish town where historical romance couples go to elope? Write in your question, I mean your answer. This is a pretty common town that people uh, run off to when they're like, oh, we want to get married really quickly by a special license. So we'll hire and travel for five days and cross the border and go to... Correct, Gretna Green, good job. At least one person wrote that incorrectly. I was going to make that a multiple choice, but I couldn't come up with really good alternative names. I was like, Gretna Green, Greater Green, Green. So, And here is the last question. Which first modern historical romance novel? The Starwood? The Flame and Flower by Kathleen Woodweiss, Woodweiss, or Captain Captive Bride by Joanna Lindsay. So, who started off modern historical romance novel? And in case you're wondering, like, how do we define that? I pulled this information from the really interesting Beyond Heaving Bosoms book, um, which is a blog, but also romance kind of. Sarah Wendell and Candy Tan. So um, they are my source for this, for defining what the modern historical romance novel is. And the answer is The Flame and Flower by Kathleen Woodbuss. So show leaderboard rankings. So thank you for uh, playing along with me. I thought that'd be a fun little uh, intermission. Let me know if you liked that or not. We can do it next week or we don't have to. Um, I'm trying to see where it tells me who the winner is. Where's my winner? Crowd leads. Rankings. There we go. That'll tell me. Okay. Congratulations, Lady Meg Edwards, with the most points at 220 points. You got three out of five correct, and you did it them the fastest. Kristen's in second with 142 points. Gloria came in third. So thank you, everyone who played. Again, let me know if you liked that or not. I'm okay with it being, <laughs> you know, uh, an experiment that we have different opinions on. <laughs> All right. Um, so now that we have played trip, I am very excited to welcome our next author. Um, we have another Scottish historical romance author, the award-winning Lori Ann Bailey. So welcome, Lori. Oh, uh, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm so glad you are on with us. So, um... Generally, uh, it, I know you write Scottish historical romance, so do you want to tell us what you are reading tonight? Uh, what I'm reading tonight is from uh, book three of my new series that came out this spring. It's The Wicked Highland Misfits, and it's a uh, based on a band of brothers and sisters who have been orphaned and come together on the streets of Aberdeen, Scotland, and they form a family unit where they take care of each other. But they they do some uh, some criminal things to get by, and uh, so all of these stories are really redemption stories. But the um, in in the first one, my heroine is a pickpocket. In the um, second one, my hero is a cat burglar. And in the third one that I'm reading from tonight, To Save a Highland Center, my heroine is a con artist. So so they all need a little bit of redemption. <clears throat> awesome. Right. Well, I'm excited to hear it. All right. 
So uh, I'm just going to read chapter one because I want you to get an idea of these uh, characters because they mean so much to me. And I, they have a lot of great dialogue and interplay further into the book. And I think you'll see that from the conflicts going in. Uh, Kate, who is the um, my uh, heroine in this book, is uh, she appears in book one and book two. So you get a little bit of flavor for her before this even starts. But uh, here goes to save a Highland Center. Aberdeen, Scotland, July 1811. Although born Catherine Mitchell, Kate went by many names. Today she'd be taking on the persona of a wealthy merchant's sister, but in actuality, the name she would be assuming belonged to a 12 year old girl who lived in the city apartment rented by her adoptive family of rejects none of whom knew of her plan or the danger she'd be facing. Her family was about to lose that home, affectionately called Camelot. The circumstances leading to the imminent catastrophe were all her fault, so she was on her way to rectify the situation. She stepped out of the carriage she'd been riding in and could finally fill her lungs. If she could have arrived by horseback or hackney, she would have but the task she'd set for herself this time required that she appear to be a lady who enjoyed refined things. She dreaded getting back into that box, even if only for the short ride remaining to reach the Earl of Stonehaven's estate. Soon she would be someone else, but for the next few minutes, she could just be Kate, a person even she no longer recognized. Kate was a woman who few had ever met, and she planned on keeping it that way. Thank you. I'll only be a couple of minutes, she said to her coachman, who she'd hired weeks ago, but only met up with this morning. She trusted the driver because he sometimes did jobs for her brother, Will Douglas, leader of their motley crew. Will was feared and known as the king of the streets. She laughed at the nickname, which seemed ridiculous to her. But there was another man in the city who had been given the moniker of King of the Docks, so she guessed it was appropriate for both men to stake out their territory. The coachman could be trusted to keep her secret safe because no one wanted to invite Will's ire upon themselves. No one except the King of the Docks had ever challenged Will. She slipped off her shoes and removed her stockings before dipping her toes into the cool creek beside the road. The stop had been spontaneous, but as she had neared her destination, the, con the confines of the coach and the pressure she had placed on herself had her heart racing. A bead of sweat trailed down her temple. The gurgling sound of the water, the fresh light of the afternoon, and the warmth of the sun enveloped her and eased the nausea in her belly. She wasn't nervous about the task in front of her. It was so easy to fool others. Most people didn't know how to sway unsuspecting souls to their cause. She did. The trick was being honest about everything you could, but lying when necessary. No, the ache in her belly had to do with that damn box she had to get back into to make her appearance at the house party where the game would begin. As she waded out into the stream, the cold, brook, the cold of the brook covered her feet and gave her clarity. This was the most carefully planned ruse she'd ever crafted. But still, she had to be able to recall the lessons she'd learned over the years. So she went over the list she knew by heart. Flatter your mark. Everyone loves to hear about themselves and how accomplished and special they are. A flattered fool will like you because they think you have things in common and you have good taste. Make them think you're on the same side. Whenever you can, try to team up with them to solve problems or, or have them help you with one. When speaking with your opponent, using we and us helps your mark associate with you because they think you both wish for the same outcome. Use your target's name. People like hearing their name, and this makes your relationship personal, adding value to your presence. They're more likely to keep you by their side and continue talking. Mimic the posture of those whose trust you seek. 
The more they think you are similar to them, the faster they will open up. Let the mark think they are winning. Doesn't everyone love to win? This puts them in a favorable mood and more likely to agree to your suggestions. Set an urgent timeline. When pressure is applied, one's reasoning is often diminished. Take advantage of a flustered target. Your flaws can be a strength. Make yourself sympathetic. Why would people trust someone who couldn't, who couldn't appear vulnerable? This one she had down to an art. Being a woman helped, but also she had some serious failings that made her appear fragile. Promise whatever you need to. Promise a meeting with a prince or another businessman. You won't be around to follow through and they don't know that yet. Hoofbeats pounded on the ground and reached her ears. She ignored the lucky bastard. Instead of riding wild and free on the back of a steed, she would be forced to return to her torture chamber. She held her face up to the sun and waited for the stranger to pass as she focused on the sounds of the gurgling stream and the nearby chirps of birds. If she could have a place to call home, it would be near a stream. The pleasant sounds had calmed her nerves and had her wishing she had found a way to take a nap. She was becoming weary of moving from location to location and never finding out who she could be if she didn't have someone else. Sure, she could stay at Camelot, but the only person who knew her there was Will. As soon as the others did, they would either want her gone or they'd leave themselves. Perhaps after this ruse, she would even purchase a horse as a companion. She'd heard they live a long time. She'd seen people heartbroken when they'd lost their domestic cats and dogs. She would not set her, herself up for that kind of pain. A mount might stay around for a nice long time. Dreams could wait. She needed to focus on a plan, the plan at hand. It had taken months of careful planning, and now the moment was at hand. She turned and strolled back to the carriage, picking up her stockings and shoes along the way. It was time. Although the pieces were in place and going according to plan, now she turned her focus to getting the job done. Gavin Davidson had never attended a house party before. He hoped never to again. Even now, he'd snuck away to race his steed down the road. Anything to wake him from the boredom of sitting around and being still. As a constable in the city of Glasgow police, he was accustomed to breaking up brawls and tracking down criminals. Danger had a way of finding him, and he had his ways of dealing with the strain by keeping a strict moral code. Gray areas didn't exist. There was only black and white, wrong or right, unlawful or innocent. He never strayed from the life. This was what kept him going and prevented him from sinking into moral dilemmas and questioning his reactions. When judgment calls could mean the difference between life and death. Of course, he spent some days doing menial tasks involving street maintenance, lighting, and occasionally refuse disposal. All of those were preferable, preferable to sitting in a room and attempting to look polite by not dunking biscuits into his tea. He liked a challenge, but so far the biggest one at the Stonehaven estate was which style of eggs to choose from the sideboard. While he liked the guests well enough that he'd met so far, this event seemed like a huge waste of, of his time. He'd only come to the Earl of Stonehaven's estate to catch a criminal. One who had he had on good authority would be here, but so far there was no sign of the villain. Lazing around the house and playing games didn't come naturally to him. He'd been working since an early age and having idle hands while he waited was driving him mad. He'd only arrived late last night, but today the activity was walking the grounds. He would have joined the others to examine the layout of the lands, but that set out just as he'd returned from his morning run. He'd seen a small portion of the grounds during his exercises, but would take time later to learn more. Even so, he didn't suspect the person he was looking for would wander far from the drawing room especially since he'd learned there would be no children around for the deviant to target. As he galloped down the road, he came across a carriage pulled over. He slowed his pace to see what could be going on. He imagined some robbery he needed to assist with, 
but all seemed well as the coachman casually waved and smiled at him. He pulled his horse up short. He had even taken to daydreaming, which was something he'd not done since he'd been a young lad. For instance, right now, he wished to place his hands around the waist of the lovely lass striding into the stream. She looked genuine, void of deception, the picture of good, honest woman who would make some man a proud husband one day if she hadn't already. Her carriage and the style of her red gown indicated she was a lady of some means, but had never known a woman of such status to give up her pretense of refined culture and be her true self. He wanted a woman like her, one who was sincere and honest, but he was too rough around the edges for such a lass, his world too dark. He scared off any lass that came near him and he couldn't help but be direct with, with them about who he was. He was not an easy man to take and he might never be husband material. He didn't know how to be gentle. Still, if he could be such, he'd want a woman like that one, a woman who knew to be, to be herself and was confident with it. He abhorred dishonesty. And that was why he found himself at a country estate not far out of Aberdeen. He had a crime to solve. Since the usual miscreant seemed to be taking a vacation in Glasgow, his superior had allowed him to pursue this case. Then he'd, moved on, then he'd move on to the one in the city of Aberdeen, Aberdeen he'd been preparing for what felt like an eternity. The assailants he was tracking had perpetrated injustices committed in his city, one recent, one over a decade ago. Both had left a muddy footprint on his soul and had the darkest part of him crying out for justice. I, he was accustomed to dealing with hardened criminals. He wouldn't know how to treat a refined lady. The last seemed to sigh as she gazed toward the heavens. Her obscured face took in the lovely day. He almost wished she'd turn his way so he could see what color her eyes were. Her hair gleamed a coppery red in the rays of the sun. Gentle hands held her skirts aloft as the water sped past her bare ankles, her shapely calves just visible. He readjusted himself in his seat, then started back toward the estate. He should be scoping out his new environment, not dreaming of not dreaming of a lass who wouldn't be able to handle his dark side. And that's the first chapter of To Save a Highland Center. How exciting. It's a great yeah, setup. I've had a lot of fun writing got, this series. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great setup when you've got, you know, the criminal and the the cop or the criminal tracker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, this um, one was a lot of fun. <laughs> we have a question from Kristen. Do you have any of your books in audio format? And if not, is that on the roadmap? It, I do not currently, but it is on the roadmap. Um, my publisher just let me know probably two or three weeks ago that um, my first five books, the, the, the Highland Pride series with them, will be on um, will be coming out on audio. The rights for those have been sold. So I don't know what the production time is. Uh, I think I have a little bit of a say in the narrators, but I haven't heard yet. So I'm excited about that. And uh, who knows uh, how long production takes, but... They're on their way. Yeah, that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. I have a question which crosses my mind every time I read a con artist character. Like you had the list of things that she does. So did you like, <laughs> do you Google how to be a con artist? Are you a con artist? How do you get that list? I, you know what? I, I watched several shows. I can't even remember what all of them were. I, I watched the, the, the um, one with uh, Rebel Wilson, is that her and name? Anne Hathaway. And Anne Hathaway. And I, I watched a couple other shows, but I also, I did a Google search on uh, what characteristics a con artist would have. And I also, I worked in there, the the we and the us. I don't, I don't know if you guys caught that part, but that, um, that I got from a book called The Gift of Fear. I don't know if you guys have ever read that, but I recommend that book for everybody. Uh, it's, I really, I, actually, I really think that book saved my life. But it, it talks about people that will, uh, 
will uh, try to get to you in a public setting and they do something called forced teaming, which makes gives you a false confidence of being on their side. So they'll come up to you and say, what are we gonna do about this? Or what should we do? So they make you a team and try to make you comfortable with them. So, so I, I did a lot of research and I had fun with that. Yeah, that is, that's very interesting. And you said this is the third in the series. How yes. many are planned for total? Right now I have eight planned. So the first three are out. Uh, I am in the process of plotting the next two. The next two are twins. And I'm hoping to actually put them out the same day next year. I toyed with that idea. <laughs> so I'm excited about that. And um, then I have Will's story. Uh, Will is the one I mentioned in there who is uh, the king of the streets and also the king of the docks is Drustin. So his story and then there's a uh, healer that you meet in some of the books. So she will get her story too. So oh, that's, that's exciting. I really love the concept of putting out twin books on the same day. But I can also imagine that might be a really stressful launch day. Yeah, I, I think it would be a stressful launch day, but it would probably be more relaxing than this year when I had all three of these come out, like back to back to back a month apart, which oh, yeah. you, you would think would be great, but you know, you're constantly uh, promoting them and on. So that was a lot of work. Yeah, that is. <laughs> so um, thinking about Romancing the Gold Coast, is there anything in particular that you recommend readers do to make it a really fun conference? I, I think just relax, have a good time, realize that uh, authors are people too. We're just like readers. Uh, we're, we're readers that also write uh, we, and we're normal. Yeah. <laughs> Come talk to us. I love to hug people. I'm, I'm fully vaccinated and I can't <laughs> wait to hug people. <laughs> Do you have a costume planned? I, I do have one planned. I haven't made it yet. I'm, Victoria Vane is waiting on my measurements very patiently, but I, I kept hoping that I would lose some of this COVID weight, but I haven't yet. So, <laughs> so I'm gonna be forced to go ahead and send her my measurements, but I'm excited. I picked out my material for the dress last, I guess a year and a half ago. Wow. <laughs> so I'm, I'm excited about that. I think I think that's gonna be great. I, I don't, I've never had, um, costume made for me so i'm super thrilled yeah that's really I exciting wait. i've enlisted my sister to do the seamstress thing for me um which the snag there is that i'm in new york and she's in new zealand so oh. <laughs> we're oh, doing so she has to come visit darn or you have to go there but i know, I know the know borders are, are closed right now, right now. <laughs> but she's yeah. able to mail me things so we're doing you know seamstressing by mail so we'll see if that works out mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome well okay so i know you mentioned that you are offering up a signed copy of the book you just read to save a highland yes. center so a signed print copy for U.S. if it's an international winner, digital. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm pulling a random number, 18, Carol Cox, who I believe is in the U.S. Yay, so congratulations, Carol. Carol. I'm going to connect you guys after the event so that you can arrange all of the signing okay. and sending. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Lori. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to read. I enjoyed the story. I can't wait to read the whole book. Um, and I hope that as some of the people on tonight get to meet you in October. Well, thank you. I appreciate being here. Yeah. Everybody. <laughs> All right. So I don't know that I've mentioned why I'm particularly excited tonight. Some of you know um, it's actually my launch day. Today I am launching a new series into the world. Uh, it's called The Prestons. It's a whole family. Um, so I decided to take tonight to actually read from my novella, which just launched today. Um, so I want to share my screen so you can see the cover. And while I do that, I'll tell you a little bit about this series. So for those of you who have a book in January of 20, 
2020, <laughs> January of 2020. Um, and I decided to write Regency Romance because I was binge reading Regency Romance, um, primarily Mary Ballow. I also was reading some Victorian, Courtney Milan and Sherry Thomas. And I loved what I was reading so much that I really wanted to uh, participate in it. And as a writer, a lot of times what you're reading then streams out of you. So into your writing. So um, my first book was my my kind of trial to see, can I write this? Do I enjoy it? And I did, and I loved it so much that I decided to publish it. And so my first series um, was kind of getting my feet wet in being a historical romance author, learning what it was to research and put together uh, a whole series. And I started thinking about what do I want to do next as I was finishing up my first series. The last book launched in March called The Husband Plot. As I was researching the husband plot, I the main characters were a white woman, daughter of an earl who has a lot of power, and the legitimate black son of the second son of a duke who owned a sugar plantation in Jamaica. Um, and in researching the husband plot and in the plot of the husband plot, I really learned a lot about slavery in the British Empire, um, and also just the economy of the British Empire. I, as an American, had always had this idea that slavery was an American problem. Um, and so researching the husband plot opened my eyes that it actually, you know, it was really more of a British problem that America was British for a lot of the time. So, you know, it was a shared problem. And also I hadn't realized, I tended to think of Britain as just like, the small island that is England, Scotland, and Wales. But I hadn't realized that even in the early 1800s, the British economy was incredibly global and relied upon the subjugated labor of enslaved people and also colonialized people in India, China, and their various huge empirical colonies. So as someone who, uh, you know, as a white person in America now, I'm trying to deal with what does it mean to, you know, be a part of a privileged part of the world. I didn't mean to get this theoretical, but I really wanted romance to be an escape for me. And I was feeling like writing, you know, a Duke, a white Duke was feeling more like, oh, I'm writing someone who's oppressing other people as he's falling in love. So I wanted to create a historical romance world where I could still kind of explore the tropes and the things that I love about historical romance without feeling guilty that my characters were actively oppressing other people. And so I just started imagining how, how would they, how could I do that? And so I came up with the idea of a family that recognized, as some of us recognize now that, oh, you know, my clothes are made from child labor. We think about that now and we boycott things. So I was like, well, what if there was a family that boycotted during Regency England? What would that mean? And as I started thinking about that, I realized there was a lot of opportunity there to explore what does it mean to make choices around how you live your life like that? What does it mean for parents to make that choice and then for the next generation to inherit that choice and think about it? So anyway, that's my inspiration for the Preston family. Uh, they are a delightful, eccentric group of people. And the book that I have launched today is The Baron Without Blame. It is a, a novella. So it's a starter novella, a prequel that's telling the story of the parents. Um, and then starting in October, I'm going to be releasing the full length novels of the rest of the series, which will take place in Regency England with the uh, children of the Prestons. So um, tonight I'm going to read to you the first chapter of The Baron Without Blame. Uh, and yeah, I hope you enjoy and feel free to type in questions in the comments and I will answer them once I finish the reading. Okay. <clears throat> On that marble balcony of Lord Lester's townhouse, wreathed by an overly ornate iron railing, it occurred to Martin Preston that human sewage stank, no matter in which city one found oneself. It fouled the sites of Calcutta as easily as it did Casablanca, sometimes stinking in town worse than seven weeks at sea. 
Even at this most magnificent ball in the great imperial center of London, Martin caught its unmistakable whiff above the fragrant springtime garden blooms. It occurred to him, too, that that thought proved he was in no mood to fraternize at Lady Lester's soiree. His head was too muddled from his travels, when instead he should be discussing the latest horse races or flirting with a pretty lady. He would do better to go straight home to his dark room and nurse a glass of Madeira. Except Madeira was out since it arrived from the subjugated Portuguese colonies. And so too was his other old favorite, the smoking pipe, whose tobacco came from the slave trade. He would have to rely on warm milk then with a splash of honey. Small comfort that would be. Martin took another deep breath, trying to summon the proper spirits to return to the ballroom. When he realized that on top of the garden roses and the city stench, there was another scent, a better scent, a human scent. Then came the sneeze. It was louder than any sneeze had a right to be. Martin could practically hear the mucus propelling out the nose. He wasn't sure which was worse, realizing he was not alone on the balcony or overhearing such a viscerally personal experience. He angled his shoulders away from the noise. Whoever was suffering such a violent eruption surely wanted their privacy. I beg your pardon, I did not realize this balcony was occupied. The sneezer sniffled methodically into a handkerchief. The fault is mine, I didn't make myself known. The voice was female, light, clear, and a faint flatness to her vowels that made Martin think of the far side of the ocean. I'm having an attack of the allergies, I'm afraid. I blame Mr. Montague's cologne. Martin swallowed back any reply. He should not be on a dark balcony alone with this voice. I thought you were my mother, which is why I didn't say anything, the voice continued before he could move. She bid me wait here while she fetches more handkerchiefs from the retiring room. Only I've been waiting for eons. Perhaps she's having a nap. An unchaperoned female voice. Now Martin really did reach for the door. I shall fetch your mother for you. Whom may I inquire after? Her reply was another sneeze. Now that he knew his companion was female, he could revel in how unladylike the sound was. No wonder her chaperone had shunted her onto a ba dark balcony. No husband could be caught when one sneezed like a blacksmith. Bless you. Oh, I so hate allergies. Her skirts rustled underneath this reply. Martin had an instant vision of Smyrna silk draped over the wide circumference of a pannier. Then, startlingly, he heard a soft thud, followed by a yelp. Martin didn't dare turn around. Are you quite all right? Yes, the voice huffed. Then, reluctantly, I suppose not. My skirts seem to have gotten caught on the railing. Even in the darkness, Martin blushed he most definitely should not be discussing skirts with an unchaperoned young lady. He reigned in his thoughts before they could race after images of petticoats and slim legs. The most proper thing to do was fetch her chaperone, but if he left her alone on this balcony, someone else could just as easily step out and discover her trapped. Which was how he found himself asking, may I offer my assistance? There was a long, reluctant silence then I suppose so, thank you. Martin turned. He could just make out her silhouette leaning awkwardly into the wall while her skirt ballooned against the wrought iron railing. Her gown was pale, a virgin white perhaps, and shone in the dim moonlight. The rest of her melted into the shadows. Clearing his throat, he crossed to the railing. His guess was one of her pannier hoops had hooked onto an ornamentation. He knelt, all too aware of her perfume which brought to mind a summer morning's mist, and tried to lift the skirt off the iron. He freed the hoop, but the silk overskirt still clung to the balcony, and Martin now saw it had been impaled, a long gash like a lightning bolt, revealing the ruffled petticoat beneath. He worked the silk carefully, so as not to tear it any further. He had just freed it of the pineapple-shaped spear when the balcony doors swung open. With a shriek, his companion jumped. She landed even closer to the wall. Most of her skirt went with her, but the triangle of fabric in Martin's fingers ripped away. 
which meant he had a fistful of her dress in his palm when he turned to face the new arrival. Of all the people who could have thrown open the balcony doors at that exact moment, it had to be Phoebe Lester. Phoebe, who considered herself so clever to have married a Marquis last year. Phoebe, who made up for her lack of friends by gossiping about anyone and everyone. Phoebe, who dramatically screamed, not Lolly Turner. Lolly straightened squarely onto her two feet and pressed both palms onto her pannier as if that would sort everything out. Lady Lester, how clever, have you seen my mother? This did not sort everything out. No sooner had Lolly gotten the word mother out than did Mama arrive, stopping short just behind Phoebe, her rouged lips opening into a horrified O. Oh. My skirts got caught on the balcony. Lolly addressed this to Mama. This gentleman was kind enough to free them for me. The gentleman in question was still crouching. As if cued by her words, he stood, and Lolly stole a look at him. Before, she had only been able to make out a general shape. He was tall, that much she had gathered. Now she took in the fashionable wig, a slim nose, silver and blue silk stretched across broad shoulders, strong legs and breeches and stockings, a dashing figure to match his deep, velvety voice. She looked away. His handsomeness would only hurt the situation, so there was no point in delighting in it. Lord Preston, I am shocked, Phoebe Lester declared. She did look rather horrified, and Lolly wondered if she had extramarital designs on this Lord Preston. He was a baron, if Lolly remembered the family correctly, and only recently inherited. She stole another glance. Yes, now she saw the black crepe ribbon tied about his left arm. The poor man was still in mourning and now caught on a balcony with her. You have not been introduced, Mama said, her dark eyes turning from Lolly to Lord Preston and back again. No, I'm afraid not, Lord Preston said. I did not realize the balcony was occupied until Miss Turner sneezed. And then I hesitated to leave when she was indisposed by a mischievous wardrobe. Lolly knew he hesitated because it was indecent to mention her skirts, but she also heard how it sounded. To her mother or to Phoebe or to her father, who unfortunately Lolly now spotted fast approaching. It sounded like Lord Preston was searching for some explanation to cover a clandestine kiss. She wished it had been a clandestine kiss. At least that would have been worth all this fuss. Lolly held up the offending skirt as proof. You see, my dress is quite ruined. We must go home at once. Except here came her father. He hovered behind Phoebe Lester for all of two seconds. Then, with frighteningly white lips, he stepped onto the balcony. What is going on here? It was my allergies, Lolly tried to explain. Mama spoke at the same time. I only left her alone for a moment. But it was Phoebe Lester who spoke loudest. Lolly Turner! caught on a balcony with a man she hasn't been introduced to. Lolly felt a hundred eyeballs turn towards the balcony. She wondered what the other guests could see from the ballroom. The white silk in Lord Preston's hand? The red of her nose from such terrible sneezing? Or just the horrified backs of her parents and Lady Lester? Her father looked her over once more. Then he turned. Well, Preston? Panic surged into Lolly's throat. She needed to stop this. She needed to explain. But when she opened her mouth, the air, filled with perfumes and colognes and flowers and city fumes, tickled her throat and nose, and she couldn't help it. She sneezed again. And Lord Preston had no choice but to say, I shall call upon you tomorrow, Lord Turner, to make a formal offer. And that is the first chapter of The Baron Without Blame. And in case you want to read the rest of the book, it is available at the major ebook retailers. It is free. It will remain free. Uh, so feel free to download it, read it. It's about 30,000 words, which is the size of a half of a normal novel. So it's a quick read to introduce you to the Preston family. Um, so I'm just going to check the questions. 
how many books are in this series? We have, we, I have planned uh, seven total titles. So there's the novella, and then um, the novella takes place in 1788, and then the rest of the series, which will be full-length novels, will take place during the Regency period and will primarily follow the children of Lolly and Martin. Spoiler alert, they end up together. Um, and I don't currently have audiobooks on my roadmap. Um, but I do hope one day to be able to get into the audiobook game. So I am uh, excited to launch this series, and I also still have my first series. Uh, so for the raffle prize tonight, I am uh, offering off the um, full ebook bundle of my first series. So that's three full books plus a short story, uh, the Countess Chronicles series. Um, and so I'm gonna offer off that ebook to the lucky random winner. So let me pull a random number, seven. Brenda Riggin. So I will follow up with you, Brenda, after this. And coming up, we have Monica Burns, who is going to be reading some of her historical romance. And she also has two different raffle prizes to give out. Um, so I have a question. Have I been to England? I have been to England uh, a couple of different times. I haven't been since I decided to write about it. Like I said, I published my first book in January 2020. So research trips kind of went out the door, but I realized recently that I'm going to be able to go soon. So I'm starting to plan my first research trip. I'm definitely going to go to London because so much of historical romance set in England takes place in London. And then I'm going to choose at least a few different areas around the country to check out um, to understand, you know, the Regency hotspots and then also get more of a sense for the countryside. I've, I've been lucky enough to visit London as well as parts of the countryside of England in the past. So I do have like a sensory memory. And then what I've also been doing as I choose different locations, let me get this and I'll come back to my mic. As I've been choosing different locations for my various series where the stories have been taking place to get a sense for the country I have this book, which is England from an aerial view. And it's, you know, an overview, literally, because it was planes <laughs> taking photos. But I like to use it to get a sense for the overall landscape. So for example, uh, you know, it has these pictures of like the horses. And so this type of horse I incorporated into the Baron without blame. And it gives you a sense in my second book, The Duchess Wager, it takes place in Northern England. And so I really uh, used these pictures to give my sen myself like a sense, sensory idea of what it would feel like. I'm trying to find that page to show you. Uh, but yeah, I'm very much looking forward to going back to England and doing more research and also visiting my friends there and kind of doing some ethnographical research, follow them around, get a sense for the culture to make sure that, you know, I think it's interesting that so many Americans write historical romance that's set in England. It was obviously the center of power in Regency times because it was the global empire and it was the capital of the global empire. Uh, so it makes sense that we are drawn to that Peer, that geographic location, but it is interesting because a lot of times we're mapping our current contemporary understanding of our culture onto this historical place. And it's often more American than it is actually British culture, um, which I think is okay. I just wanna stay in touch with what those differences are so that I know <laughs> when I am just departing from British culture and saying, oh, I wanna comment on my experience as a modern American person using historical England as my filter or lens. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm definitely looking forward to getting back to England. I know Monica will be joining us in a few minutes. Another book that I relied on for my historical romance research for The Baron Without Blame is the this East India Company. This is a very cursory overview of the East India Company. I wanted to get more of a sense because I had heard a lot about it and I had read a lot of different like anecdotal things about the East India Company. But as I was researching the husband plot, I realized that the East India Company was kind of like the Google of our times. Like everyone was impacted by the East India Company in England. If you look at the London Times newspaper, like half of the pages are just completely overtaken by notices about the East India Company or by the East India Company. And so I really wanted to get an understanding of that because they were basically the conduit between the colonies and England and it, they, they drove the economy. So I used this book to um, get a sense for that. There's a lot more to learn about the East India Company. I'm not an expert yet, but it's a very interesting dynamic that the East India Company had. All right, so now I am super excited to introduce our final reader, Monica Burns. Welcome, hey. Monica. <laughs> <laughs> nothing, <went right. laughs> nothing, absolutely nothing went right from the time I emailed you. Absolutely nothing. Oh, no. <clears throat> I am on well, my laptop. I look terrible. It's just, guys, you know, if you know me, you read me, you know that I'm a complete basket case. So this is typical. <laughs> well, my intro for you is you are a best-selling and award-winning author of spicy, historical, contemporary, and paranormal romance. So um, we're very excited to have you on tonight and to hear your reading. Um, thanks. And I have, I tried to get over to my, hopefully my Facebook group knows how to find me because I, like I said, nothing worked right and I couldn't get the right link to get over here. So hopefully they'll not be too mad at me because you are going to put this on. Um, it's streaming live to YouTube. Right but now, it will, and it will be stay on. It'll stay on YouTube, right? Because they can go yes, back. Yes, it will. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, because I invited somebody special tonight to do this with me. I do voices so terribly. I, I my friends say I have a Southern accent. I say I don't. So trying to imitate an English accent is completely. Uh, it's abysmal. So I decided that I would invite somebody to join me, and we're going to see how this works. Being the tech guru that I am. Um, if you follow me or you're in my group, you will know exactly how funny this is actually going to be. So um, bear with me for a second, okay? <laughs> sure. All right. And I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna read from my Kindle because it's where I'm at, it's dark. I tried, they got this really cute little line that says, uh, you know, pro tip to make yourself look good, lighting works. And I'm like, I'm in my lazy boy. What the hell do you want from me? Um, <laughs> so, this book is um, the reading I'm reading from is Forever Mine. It's um, the time travel. It's uh, it's a book of my heart. I promote this book religiously at six years old, and I'm still. It's like it just came out to me. So with this particular book, she um, has been missing for three weeks and she tumbles through time. Or when I say she's been missing, she's taking the, the heroine is taking the place of a, the wife of a, a um, an Earl and he finds her and they do not like each other at all. <clears throat> uh, she's a complete witch. And so he has brought her home saying, you know, I don't believe you. You're just, yes, you're my wife. She says, no, I'm not. So they've had this discord going the whole way. And now I'm going to read from, the scene where she's actually been brought back to the house and she's trying to get herself um, together um, in terms of what's happening. So she's doing pretty good. Is that you flipping around or is that me? <laughs> okay. We're that close. was me. I just wanted to put your cover up so people no, can see it. That's fine because I'm just, like I said, nothing's gone right. I'm just making sure I'm not losing it. <laughs> so, okay. So let's do this reading. Um, and it's somewhat spicy. I don't know what spicy is to people. It's not spicy to me, but it's actually pretty tame. 
Eager to bathe and wash off the dried grime of her earlier ordeal, Victoria reached behind her to unbutton her dress. It was a struggle working with the gown's small buttons, but she'd managed to undo the dress almost to the waist when the bedroom door crashed open. Startled by the noise, she whirled around to see the Earl appear in the bathroom doorway. What the hell do you think you're doing? This His anger was almost as furious as it had been at the cottage, but this time she was a wasn't afraid of him. I'm getting ready to take a bath? This game of yours has gone far enough, madam. I demand to know why you aren't in your usual bedchamber. It's a mausoleum, and I asked Mrs. Beecham for a different room. And you selected this room out of all the other bedrooms in the house. You expect me to believe you had no other reason for selecting this particular room? Despite his outrage, she saw puzzlement darken his gaze. What other reason would I have? At her reply, he limped forward and caught her by the arm, then half dragged her out of the bathroom. With a vicious jerk, he opened the door she'd not opened and pointed to the opposite end of the corridor. This hallway, madam, leads to my bedchamber. His words were ice chips scattering through the air. She shrugged and one of the sleeves of her gown slipped off her shoulder. Frustrated, she tugged it back into place. You're upset because I picked a room that happens to be next to yours? Arms folded across his chest, the Earl remained silent, his expression indicating he'd expected some sort of explanation from her. Completely at a loss as to what he wanted her to say, Victoria shrugged again. This time she was forced to pull both sleeves back up to her shoulders. She returned his glare, irritated they were arguing about what room she should be sleeping in when she could be soaking in a hot bath. What? Victoria rolled her eyes at him as she waited for the man to explain why he was so upset that she was in the room next to his. Dark eyebrows arched in a disdainful sneer. Nicholas pointedly slashed his gaze toward her bed, then returned his derisive look to her face. I have no intention of sleeping in your bed after all the lies between us, madam. His cold declaration made Victoria's mouth fall open before she narrowed her eyes at him. Of all the arrogant, egotistical, I didn't have any idea this room was next to yours. Not that I care, because I have no intention of sleeping with you either. The man was crazy if he thought she was interested in sleeping with him. In the back of her mind, she heard a cackling laugh. <laughs> she ignored it. Now this is the Vicky I'm accustomed to seeing. Smug satisfaction crossed his face as he mocked her. Infuriated by his condescending tone, Victoria fought back the urge to respond with a scathing retort. If she got angry, she might say something that would make her get locked up in that asylum. She whirled around to stalk back to the bathroom, stumbling over the hem of her gown as she did so. Damn it. Her balance regained, she continued forward. But a moment later, firm hands caught her arms and she was tugged backward into a hard chest. Heat swept across her skin like wildfire. wildfire then sank through her pores into her blood until it spread through every inch of her. Swallowing the knot about to close her throat, she tried to shake off his grip. Let me go. Why, Vicky? The warmth of his breath singed her earlobe. Perhaps I should take advantage of our close proximity to each other. After all, you are my wife. The caustic remark made her go still. Did he really expect her to... With a violent twist of her body, she freed herself from his grasp, tugging her sleeves back up to her shoulders. Her gaze met his, and heat skimmed over her skin once more as she stared up at him. Oh, God. The only smoldering looks she'd ever seen were in the movies, but this one outdid all of those. Worse, it took her thoughts in a dangerous direction. She gulped, then drew in a deep breath. You can wish all you want, but it's not happening because I'm not your wife. And stop calling me Vicky. What exactly do you propose I call you? There was more than a hint of sarcasm in the question, and she ignored his mockery. Vickery. Victoria, it's my name. You hate being called Victoria. You think it makes you sound like a dowager countess. Very well, Victoria. I don't... Okay, and we're completely lost now. Um, let's see. Thank you, Brian, for not being very cooperative here. Where did I leave off? Okay. Um, 
you hate being called Victoria. You think it makes you sound like a dowager countess, yada, yada, yada. What your wife prefers and what I prefer are two different things. I've never liked being called Vicky. She lifted her chin in defiance, determined to make him use her proper name. She'd hated being called Vicky all her life. It had actually made her feel as if she'd done something wrong. Speculation darkened the eyes pinned on her before he nodded abruptly. Very well, Victoria. Thank you. I believe it's in your vocabulary, Victoria. And we missed over a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, the, small touching his the smile touching his central mouth hinted he was baffled by her behavior. The moment he spoke her name, her skin tingled as if she'd been shocked. There was a seductive quality to the deep timber of his voice that made her heart race and release butterflies in her stomach. Even his green-eyed gaze made her heart jump in her chest. God help her if she decided to unleash the full force of his good looks and charm on her. If thank you isn't in your wife's vocabulary, and I refuse to let you call me Vicky, how much of a leap is it to accept that I'm Victoria Ashton, not your countess? An impossible one. The impassive, unyielding mask had returned to his face, convince you. The quiet sincerity and frustration in her voice seemed to touch a nerve in him. A strange look crossed his face, and he closed the distance between them. Victoria struggled to keep her pulse under control as his quizzical gaze warmed her skin. With a swift movement, he captured her chin in his strong fingers, his thumb tracing the fullness of her bottom lip. The unexpected caress made her quiver as her heart pounded a fierce rhythm inside her. I wonder. The soft words sounded as though he was speaking his thoughts out loud. Mesmerized by his hooded gaze, anticipation sent a delicious warmth racing through her body. She licked her lips and drew in a quick breath as the Earl's head descended toward her mouth. The instant his lips met hers, a wave of desire swept her out into the depths of a sea she'd never swum in before. Fire blazed its way through her limbs, and she trembled with an unexpected need. Base instinct took control as she returned his kiss, her tongue teasing his lips apart until it danced with his. The growl reverberating in his chest sent a frisson tingling through her as she pressed her body into his. God, her knees were actually rubbery from this kiss. None of the other men she dated had ever made her feel wobbly like this. Warm hands pushed the sleeves of her gown downward until she heard a soft ripping sound. The sleeves fell away from her arms and the gown's bodice fell to her waist. A low moan rose in her throat as his hand caressed the top of one shoulder before he wrapped his arms around her to pull her tight against him. Their kiss deepened as his tongue mated with hers in a furious dance of desire. Victoria murmured a protest as his lips slid away from hers to glide down the side of her neck to her shoulder. Lost in the fire of his touch, she didn't realize he'd undone the laces of her corset until he caught the tip of her breast in his mouth. She shuddered as he sucked on her nipple, then gently bit down on it before swirling his tongue around the hard peak until her skin was hot. An ache latched itself to her insides, and she realized she was wet between her thighs. The heat melting through her tugged another moan from her, and her hands slid through the black thickness of his hair. Oh, God, she wanted him. She wanted him now. On the floor, on the bed, she didn't care, as long as he eased the intense longing, clutching the lower half of her body. He'd not changed out of his writing clothes, and her hand slid down across his chest to his erection, it was hard and thick beneath his breeches. A dark rumble sounded in his throat as she stroked him through the fawn-colored material. Trembling with the frightening need for him, Victoria uttered a soft cry as a shudder rippled through her, and she recognized it for the small climax it was. If the man could make her have an orgasm with only a kiss, heaven help her when he actually entered her. Lost in the heated pleasure of the moment, she vaguely heard the knock at the door. The knock sounded again and with a sharp movement, Nicholas released her. Quickly stepping away from her, he tugged her corset and dress up before he issued an authoritative command to enter. As a young woman entered the room, Nicholas was already heading toward the connecting door between their rooms. Molly, see to it the Countess is downstairs in the salon within the hour. What the hell do you think you'll... And we're going to end it on that right there. <laughs> My God.
Catherine. That was so fun. Okay, right. <laughs> he got he got ahead of me there. So thank you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm uh, curious about the technology. Is Brian a real person? Brian is an AI. He's an AI okay. voice that I created. So I, like I said, I do accents very, very badly. And not only am I promoting the book because it's my favorite, but I'm also for, this is the, we're in the production or rather in the pre-production stages of um, casting voices. And we have found a great female voice and we're working on trying to get um, the male voice uh, hooked up because there's so much banter in this book that if you had, you know, a lot of times you do audio, the characters, if you do a duet, I think it's what they're called duets. I'm not, I'm still learning the business. Um, you have a male voice read the male point of view in one chapter and then it flips to the female. Well, in this book, it's going to be even like, it's going to be like a movie because in this chapter, when you would be hearing in the audio version, you're going to hear female reading the, her point of view, but he's going to respond just like Brian, the AI guy did here on screen. So that was, it was kind of a twofold purpose here was to see, hey, how would it sound? My um, production person for the audio book of this that we're working on, I, I tested this with her last night and she, she died. She goes, please don't ever do an audio book like this. <laughs> and I said, yes, I won't. But it it was it, it was really more of a kind of like, well, hey, let's see what it happens. And you know, his voice isn't too bad. And I was able to actually do some of the really kind of, you know, like the stressing of different syllables and stuff. And I did all of that within oh, maybe an hour. It took me about an hour to come up with all this. So um in terms of like creating the stress of words, um, and it, it it's not perfect. But I think that it could be down the road. I mean, in another 20, 25 years, you're going to wind up having the ability to, it'll be like, you know, the the things that people who use who have lost their vocal box cord, you put mm -hmm. it up here and you talk. I think you're eventually going to be able to speak into um, your computer and then you'll be able to change it around. And in some ways, that's really cool for um, books or for other things. But in other ways, it's kind of scary, too, because you can, I don't know if you're familiar with um, oh, deep, deep fake video. Uh, where yeah. They, yeah. yeah. It, it can get kind of, technology can be wonderful, but it can be pretty scary, too. So, um, but I had a lot of fun doing this, and I figured it, if I, I'm, I'm class clown, so I figured I might as well go a full, full tilt tonight. Yeah, the readers are loving it in the comments. It was very oh, fun. <laughs> Good. Yeah. I've, been, I've been trying not to crack up and, and die in front of everybody with them like reading the sex piece and that's hardly any sex there because I get so embarrassed. <laughs> so tell me more about Forever Mine. Is it part of a series? Uh, good question. It, it has um, a prequel that for the last five years I've been trying to write. I have a couple of scenes already plotted out and written. And um, the, the prequel is basically um, about, it's a complicated book. The time travel has two storylines in it. One is present day and one is past day. The it's, it's more of a reincarnation than time travel basically. But the main characters, Nicholas and Victoria, are also Nicholas and Victoria in the present. Um, but in the past and present, they also have some characters that they meet up with in the present as well. One of those is Nora, who is uh, Nicholas's sister in the present, but she is a good friend called Anna in the past. So for the first two years, I wanted to tell, and, and Anna is married to Sebastian, who is Nicholas's best friend. So. I wanted to be able to tell, I actually have two books that I want to write about Anna and Sebastian because they have a really, really kind of cool type of relationship um, that you don't even really see in Forever Mine. But it's complicated because one, Nicholas's sister 
is Nora in the present, but she's Anna in the past. So I have had to come up with a way to make that make sense, which it did. I finally figured that out after three years. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so then um, I just kept getting little bits and pieces coming to me. And now I have, it's all kind of a mishmash out there in front of me. And I tried starting to write on it a couple of months ago and I've gotten a total of nine pages written of the first chapter and it stinks. It's just so terrible. So I, I have it with an editor friend of mine and she's going to like tell me what she sees wrong. It could be that I'm just really afraid of the book. I mean, forever mine has been, you either love or you hate the book. And if you love the book, you love it to the nth degree. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a real, what, what do they call it when something really um, polarizing? Yeah. It's a very polarizing type of book. I've even had <laughs> one of my favorite Goodreads um, reviews mentions necrophilia. If you're ne is it necrophilia? Yeah. Where they, you have sex with dead bodies. Um, <laughs> I thought that was pretty hysterical personally, <laughs> but um, that's what I'm saying. It's a very polarizing type of book. Um, but forever yours is completely different, which is, Anna and Sebastian's story because she goes to the past and she doesn't come back. So I have to explain how she doesn't come back, why she doesn't come back. Um, so I got just really frustrated and I just said, Oh, fuck it. <laughs> and I went to that. I had already started another time travel series and I'm, that's six chapters into that. So I think I'm going to stick with that for the time being. Awesome. So, but it, it's it's a good book, and if you ask the question, and I don't remember what it was, so I apologize. So oh no no no, and um, how do you choose? You know, obviously you're interested in time travel. How do you choose like which part of the past the characters are traveling to or from? Well, I can I can tell you that I'll never go to medieval Scotland or medieval anywhere. <laughs> um, when I was a kid, I used to camp, and I mean I love camping. But I know what it's like to be with unwashed bodies for a whole weekend or for a whole week, even if you do sponge bathing or you go to a private campground that has a shower. It's for my nose. It just doesn't work. So I'm not going back to the medieval time period, period. I mean, I think it's really cool with the nights and all that, but it was smelled atrocious. And I know that they most of them, especially the rich, rich people were really um, they, they washed once a week and they were fairly, you know, keep kept clean. But I went to a house here in Richmond um, called Agecroft, which is a piece. It's an old medieval house that they brought from Europe back over here. Some rich person did into Richmond and rebuilt it. And when you have the pit toilet in between the entry to the dining room and the kitchen, and it's right at the kitchen, I'm sorry, I'm just not going there. <laughs> so, that, that right there will tell you why I'm not that, I just that's kind of long around reason why I will never go back to medieval Scotland or any place but the time travel that I'm working on now actually does go to Victorian Scotland um, up near Aberdeen um, and it's a total of three different stories it's a proposal I put up to I sent to Berkeley my editor at Berkeley um, Penguin Berkeley and I haven't heard anything back but I decided well I'm just going to go ahead and I'm, I want to write it because I like the story especially this current um, couple, um, Ian and, um, God, my mind just drew a complete blank. I can't remember her name. <laughs> this, oh, I'm sorry. Um, McKen uh, not McKen, that's the dog's name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, Madeline, Madeline, Matt, it's, it's Ian and Madeline. So um, they, they've, um, they've met. And he's really kind of, he's very sweet, but he's also very kind of alpha, but he's got a great backstory. Um, and um, he's, it's more his story than it is her story. So she's kind of like, okay, I'm in the past. So what? So he's hot. Let's, you know, like, let's do it sort of thing. But um, yeah. Okay. And I've got, I've got, a, got a, I have a couple of other books that I've been trying to write of just the time. Time is just so limited for so many things these days. Yeah. And um, I'm asking everyone about Romancing the Gold Coast, and I know you've attended conferences before, so do you have any advice for readers who are going to be there, how they can take advantage of the conference and get the most out of it? Um, don't sleep. 
<laughs> uh, I'm bipolar. And so for me, when I go to a conference, they're very invigorating, but they're also very draining. Um, and depending on the type of conference that I go to, if it's a writer's conference, I come home and I'm like so totally stoked and I, I, I get to the computer and I'm writing like mad. So I kind of miss not having those kind of conferences to go to um, more often. Um, reader conferences are great. For a reader, it's easier, I think, than it is the author. An author always has to be on, if that makes sense. Um, but the whole point of going to a reader conference is to talk romance and to talk about the books that you love. Um, for authors, it's a, it's a chance to talk about your books without your family dropping dead from boredom um, and getting to know the authors. Cause I, I never really understood why people, anybody would want to get to know me. I, I really didn't understand that, but um, apparently people want to know me. <laughs> I really, I still, I still do not know why, because I'm not that interesting a person. In fact, I'm pretty bloody boring. Um, but I would, I would say that, a lot of times authors, not everyone is like me, okay? I'm gonna say that right up front. I'll be in the bar or a restaurant and if I see somebody who I either met very briefly, was introduced to me at, at a standing in line at the buffet or if they had swung by and somebody, and I remember their name, because I try to remember people's names because it's important to let people know that you pay attention to them. So I'll just grab them and I'll pull them. I'm like, hey, come sit with us. So don't be afraid to approach an author um, if, if you see that they, they're giving you the eye of like, hey, come on over. Um, if you see that they're at an author, at a reader conference like this, we're all gonna be open to like wanting to talk to readers, period. It doesn't matter what you read or who you are. Uh, it, it's, a, it, it's just be yourself. I guess is the best way to, I guess obviously I'm being myself because I haven't shut up yet. <laughs> no, that's great advice. I think the, my experience so far, this is going to be my first conference as a writer, but I think um, what I've experienced so far is that it's a hugely welcoming community. And yeah. so that's going to be the same for the readers and it's going to be like yeah. best friends that you didn't even know you had getting together for a weekend. Well, it, I, I don't know if you've noticed on some of the author emails, um, there was a, somebody had a question about something and I, I asked, oh, Kim was talking about the DJ. And I said, does this mean I bring my Michael Jackson costume? And I don't know if you remember or not, but uh, Kim and somebody, oh, Kim. And I think it was, um, oh God, who else? Um, somebody else said, yes, big letters, exclamation mark. I'm known for doing thriller or leading thriller, the thriller dance at a DJ thing. And I have the glove and the hat and the glasses, which is really kind of hysterical. So most, if, if people didn't know already why they needed to come, now we know we're gonna do Thriller. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm pretty well known for that. I mean, um, I've done it at a lot of different conferences and it, sometimes people, they watch, but they're supposed to join in and do it with me so I don't make a complete fool of myself. But yeah, I mean, if you if you like Michael Jackson, you, Jackson, you like Thriller, this is definitely one of the biggest reasons to come because you get to dance thriller. Awesome. Well, I know uh, everyone's been with us for two hours, so I don't want to keep any too long, but um, no, I know you have two prizes to give away. You yes. are offering yes. up a print copy of forever mine and an ebook of forever mine. Correct. Correct. So I take it you're going to take care of all that or what do I need to do? Yes. So I'm generating random jump numbers. So the first number is 11. Gail Homeland. So Gail. Hey, well, I was going to say, I'll just let me write it down on the. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, sure. And I will connect you afterwards. Okay, so cool. That's Gail cool. is winning the print signed copy from Monica. And the next number for the ebook of Forever Mine is Lisa H. So I will connect you guys after this so that you can claim your prizes. 
<laughs> thank you, Monica. Thank, thank you, you, everyone, for an, an awesome night. We're doing this again next week, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. We have another five authors lined up for you. Gina Conkle, Tammy Anderson, Beth Williamson, Heather Snow, and Mira Platt. So uh, I look forward to seeing you there. You've, you're already registered, so you just have to show up. So thanks so much, and see you next week. Thank you.